So without any further delay, Mr. David Hayes. Thank you very much, Superintendent Tutai. As I was telling some of the dear folks from Winona, I did my master's degree at Michigan Tech, so I know what it's like up there. But I did only one winner there. Thank you very much. Um, well, welcome tonight. Welcome to Zandy. Welcome to Rick, Benita, all my friends here. Julie, Susan, thank you for calling me to do this. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about archaeology around the Caribbean, the organizations that are supporting it, um, and things like this. Um, it's a little bit rushed for me because I did get this done pretty quickly. Um, but good old US National Weather Service map of the Caribbean. Um, you get this online anytime you like. You can get it six feet long if you want. I've just reprinted this. Um, one very important thing to remember in the Caribbean, it's obvious, the wind and the current comes out of the east. Um, so if you're sailing or rowing, you want to go west or cut, go along the coast. It's been true for years until basically the mid-19th century when we could get steam-powered boats going the other way. But remember this, that all of your cur currents and your people are moving in a counterclockwise counter direction here. Um, the other thing this points out is that these people had no metal. Before the Europeans showed up here, there were a couple of little pieces of gold floating around the Caribbean. Not much, no copper, even though it, there's a lot of copper in the Northeast and the United States. There is no obsidian here either. You're missing a couple of your most important tools. You've got to work with shells and stones here to make your tools. Um, get rid of my glasses so I can actually read what I've said. Um, of the gold the, in the Virgin Islands, there are two pieces of it. Thanks to the, fellow, uh, the park on St. John, there are two eye pieces that have been found at Cinnamon Bay. And it, we're hoping to get a paper. Some people are working on a paper on those at this point in time. Uh, <coughs> The other thing I'm going to be saying is, I'm not going to be using names that a lot of people use. The historians like the names Arawak and Carib. They're both European impositions upon the local people. The people that the historians like to call Arawak or Taino, the people that let the historians like to call Carib are Kalinago. Uh, and they have literally just changed their legal name to the Kalinago Nation on the island of Dominica. Everybody always used to think of it as the Carib Reserve. It is now the Kalinago Nation. Um, and this is what we find here. This is from a St. Thomas Daigle at two, and the heck did I dig this, 2014. Um, thank you all for the Federal Highways Funds. I brought in 12 qualified archaeologists, including four PhDs in Caribbean archaeology, and they had conniption fits. Um, the piece in blue is a, what I would call a basket handle. As far as we can tell, it's aligned properly. It's about two-thirds of a handle. It's the only one ever been found in the Virgin Islands, and about four of them found in the Caribbean. The culture that is using these was Pan-Caribbean. The same thing was a little face on the upper right-hand corner. Um, that didn't even occur in Tutu at the same time. This occurred on the Main Street site. It's a Cisaladoid site um, dating to around 400 AD. In other words, about 1,600 years ago. Um, and so, You'd look at the bottom thing, and that's pretty hard to tell how big that is, but that's about eight inches tall. The fun story is it was found by the newest archaeologist. He had just been hired by the company that I was working with to do this a month before. We shut down the, the entire project to look at that bowl. Because the closest place those come from is Isla Roques, just off the Venezuelan coast. This is how much 
the transport 1,600 years ago was going on around here. Nothing has changed. We still talk about moving around. Trying to do a little bit more modern period. Um, upper left is the same piece that's right below it. That's how it was found. It's back showing. Nobody thought anything of it. It's red ware. Wrong. It's Moravian pottery. Um, the Moravians came here in the 1770s to educate the enslaved population. That was one of their goals. But one of their requirements was that each community be self-supporting. Never really worked out that here. But they're originally Central European, moved to Lower Denmark, uh, and made this redware. It's also been made in the U.S. in Moravian colonies in North Carolina and Pennsylvania. Uh, for years, Syracuse University, my good friend Doug Armstrong, had been working over there for years on St. John and St. Thomas. One or two projects over here. They hadn't figured out what it was. And when this piece came up, it's, if you read the scale below, they're always in centimeters. <coughs> To put it in inches, it's four or five inches high, a couple inches wide, it's a milk bowl, literally. It's a thing that's about 18 inches in diameter, about four inches deep. Uh, very red, got classic yellow and green, um, drip molding, drip decoration across it. Okay, that's not uncommon here on these islands. We've got Moravians around. We've got three big Moravian churches on this island. Moravian people here to this day. But what gets to be very interesting is that blue piece. Two thirds of an excellent piece of Chinese export porcelain. That material is about a millimeter thick. That's fine China. Where did it come from? Danes did never get to the Far East, they never got to China. It had to be traded, either through Veracruz or through the Dutch, ter Dutch uh, traders back to Amsterdam. But what gets very, very interesting when you actually realize where this site is, it's on the south coast of St. Croix on a promontory that looks over a number of anchorages. Um, you remember that the Danes make their money by taxing sugar on their exports. Well, this is one of the two places on the south coast of this island where they had people watching to make sure sugar was not smuggled off this island. At this place were two members of the Royal Slave Corps, two enslaved Africans from the largest group of enslaved people here, owned by the King of Denmark, one non-commissioned officer. This is not what you'd call the people you'd expect to be living off fine porcelain in China. But they had it. They also had nice Moravian stuff. What's not in this picture, and it's very hard to photograph, is the locally made pottery. We have good clay here um, and can make pottery. So we've got a small group of people who are not getting much money, but they're living fairly high. I leave you to make further conclusions. This piece, anybody think, can think of where that design comes from? Think Mesoamerica, Guatemala. Are we looking at the right uh, slide? Are we looking at the right oh, slide? Sorry, David? sorry. There we go. <laughs> okay. It, I had the I had the, this slide up there, but that hadn't moved. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> I'll look at Julie's. It's Julie's computer. The next time I'll bring mine. <laughs> Middle America. There's about six of these people, pieces found throughout the Caribbean. Pearls in Grenada is the most common of the sites right off the South American coast. They've been scattered up the street from there. There's actually a third piece of this. Um, it was 
was literally found the last day of this dig in St. Thomas. I grabbed it out of the sidewalk with the site is returning to construction crew and they carried it. We have the entire profile from the bottom to the left. That doesn't sound like much to a lot of you, us archaeologists, that's the dream world. We know what this vessel looked like. Uh, we don't know where it came from. But if you remember that map, to get to these islands, that piece would have gone down along the South Amer Central American coast to Grenada and then up these islands in sailing canoes or road canoes. It probably took several years to make its trip. People are trading. Um, Interestingly enough, the iconography on it doesn't ever get copied by the local people. Okay. Let's see if it works this time. Yep. Yep. This is what happens when you get the University of Leiden to do your lithic analysis. Um, Sebastian Klippenberg. Uh, more lithic analysis of the Caribbean than anybody wants to admit. Um, upper left corner, a stone that doesn't exist in the Virgin Islands, it is critical. Flint or chert, that's what you're going to make your fires with. It doesn't occur in the Virgin Islands. Long Key off Antigua is the home of most of the chert in the Caribbean. And yet, somebody's brought a big piece of it up here and processed it into tools. The little chips are just that, chips. A big piece at the top could be a scraper, could actually be a flint for making fire. If anybody has any questions, just raise your hands, please. I can see you. Um, on the larger image there, starting with the largest thing, that red carnelian bead, about a centimeter across, a little bit over a centimeter long, and it is a full bead. <coughs> like everything in that photograph, it has a hole drilled through it. Carnelian is quartz, one of the hardest stones around. Carnelian's nearest source, Montserrat. Trading away. Somebody's having fun. Somebody's spending a lot of time making those things. To drill that hole, you've got to have a hard wood <coughs> stick with some sand and spend a lot of time sitting there. The things across the top are just straight quartz. Uh, compared to carnelian, they're not as cool, but still, they're incredibly cool. Um, there are stones, but the, uh, the, the stones. So, um, again, we're trading in the Caribbean here. This stuff is all coming from our east to us here. I'm not sure what we're sending back. Because all the islands make their own pottery. There's no reason for us to be trading pottery. We can all grow the same fruit here. So what are we trading back? for these very high value, high critical items that we need uh, in this island. Um, now we're coming. Um, cells, axes. Three of those are from St. Croix, one's from Puerto Rico. The large one is Puerto Rican. The other two, from the three are from here. They're also on that table at the back there, at the side back there. Um, that big one is almost 10 inches long. The little tiny one, I don't know if you can see the tiny one, can you? That thing's only about this big. It's not going to do much good, but it's going to be great jewelry. Um, the other two are sort of average size, you know, the sort of range we get here on the island. Um, Please don't come after me with any of these in your hand. I'm going to run as fast as I can. Um, 
this, I would suggest you do the same if I come after you. Uh, the second smallest one, the furthest to the left, has grinding on it. it its edge is a little bit dull. They were using it to grind afterwards. Uh, these can also be used as hoes. Uh, there's nothing there, just like a modern hoe, except modern hoes are metal. These are stone. Um, okay. Famous three-pointers, zemis, religious items. Um, the top one is a reproduction from the Dominican Republic. The bottom one is found on the northwest coast of St. Croix years and years ago. Um, the patterns are very similar. It's fairly hard stone. What is the most interesting about the zemis is the largest ones come from the largest islands. Puerto, the Dominican Republic has the largest of them, then Puerto Rico, and they're all through the Lesser Antilles, but they're all much smaller. Whether or not you can argue that it's you know, more people or whatever, but the patterns are much the same. We have one in our museum, a little bit smaller than the bottom one, that is impossible to photograph. The bottom has been cupped inward so that you can literally hold water on the bottom of it, although I don't think you want to do that. And incised into the things are tiny, tiny, half millimeter lines with faces around the point. People are spending a lot of time on their religion here, and they're passing it among the islands. Um, ah. Now we can have some fun. stop an archaeologist in his tracks. Either one of those pictures will do it. Um, picture on the right, that's Sikarampika, the local whelk shop. Um, but it's about 30 of them in that photograph. That's what shut down six million dollar federal highway project in St. Thomas. That picture. That's how important they were. When we finished the site, we had over 3,000 of them. Most interesting thing is we had less than 10 cog shells. That's an awful lot of whelks and very few cogs. And they're coming out of the St. Thomas Harbor, which was a fairly shallow harbor at that time. It's not anymore. These are a couple hundred meters inland from there. Um, we were finding these things burnt, cooked in every single way you could. Okay, that's what you stop sites with. The thing on the left, the frog turtle, I'm not sure what it is. Um, the problem is all three legs are broken off of it. And we, we sit there and we try and put them back on, and every time we put them back on, they seem to go on a different way. So it sort of looks like a frog in this case. Um, it could be a turtle, but I think it's a frog. Um, my friends are arguing with me that it's a turtle. That thing's about four inches high, made from the inside of a conch shell. Think of how long these people had to work to make that. Both the frog and the turtle are important in the rel religious cosmologies of the, the people that we call at the time the Saladoid, they are the pre-Taino people. Um, the Saladoid culture dies out at about 600 AD. The Taino culture begins at about 800 AD with a repopulation of the Caribbean. Um, this site in St. Thomas does not date past 550 AD. This is what's happening. We're finding frogs this sort early on. They changed to jaguars during the Taino period. Um, that is in a warehouse in St. Thomas. Actually, no, it's not in a warehouse. It's in the acting director for the State Historic Preservation's office sitting in a box behind a locked door because it ain't going anywhere. 
it just ain't. Um, we, uh, we have extensive photography of it, and um, unfortunately the video I wanted to show is not going to work tonight, but that's okay. The boring stuff. Spindle whorl on the right. You gotta make all your own clothes. You gotta spin your cotton. There are no spinning machines. You gotta sit there, get the fibers, clean the seeds out of them, and twist it all into a very nice thread, and then weave your fabric. By the standards of 400 years ago, we're all massively overdressed. We've got far more cloth available to us than they did. Lose 90% of the cloth on your body, and you'll get back to what they had. Now, granted, it works down here. It might not work in Minnesota. <laughs> um, you know, on the left, piece of conch shell. Um, it's the lip from the queen conch. Um, been broken off and turned into a hoe. This one is over there also. It's been resharpened um, at the bottom to make a very nice handheld hoe um, that will um, dig your dirt up. You know, skin an animal. You've got iguanas, you've got dogs, you've got turtles, you've got fish. Um, you've got to process all these animals. Um, manatee is probably your largest animal you're going to find here. West Indian manatee, which is extinct now, but was common here a thousand years ago. Um, there, they are. Um, okay. Going from making an archaeologist happy to making an archaeologist cry. These are stone. What you're looking at, the white thing that's sort of going away from you, is a diving board for a sense of scale. It's about 15, 18 inches wide as a diving board tends to be. These three artifacts were found in about 2001 on private property. Therefore, they are the property of the landowner in the Virgin Islands. Um, however, this is the three nicest stone objects that have ever been found on St. Croix. We don't know where they are. We have no clue where they are. They're similar to stuff found in Puerto Rico and Down Island. But these are missing. You know, they're legally missing. It's nothing illegal about what's been done. It just makes some of us cry. <laughs> I would love to actually have those I'd love to give them back to whoever owns them after I've taken a mold of them so that I can reproduce them. But they are completely missing from our... Um, this is a photograph of a photograph. It's the only known record of them. Um, yeah, we know where they were found. We know all that good stuff. But we don't know who's got them. They disappeared very quickly. People pretending they're worth financial money. I wouldn't want it. Wouldn't want to argue that they're worth a lot of money. They are worth some money. In particular, some people. I mean, why are we looting artifacts from Syria? Because there are people who are willing to pay for this stuff and support Daesh. And people will pay for artifacts, um, regardless of where they come from. Um, a few more. Two Adornos are again over there. Both of them are from St. Croix, different sites on the island. Um, we don't know exactly where, we have rough ideas of where. So, to help archaeology in the Virgin Islands, there's a number of people who can, you can talk to. This gentleman right here is critical. And <laughs> you've got the um, University of um, is Tulsa coming back? Yeah. Yeah. Adewadi's coming back. Yeah, she's Dr. Adewadi. She did her dissertation on part of the... Remember, we are in the slave trading headquarters of the Danish West Indian Company. Danish West Indian Company, right here. This is where the enslaved people came 
and worse so <coughs> this building extended across Hospital Street. U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Sandy's back there. Atlas is more than turtles. Atlas is more than the Sandy Point or Orchid and all that other stuff. There is a major site in there, and the University of Mississippi is coming back to dig there this summer. Um, yeah, so. Um, in the Virgin Islands Department of Planning and Natural Resources, these are the people who control the Columbus Landing Site at Salt River. It's not in this gentleman's hands, it's in National the DPNR's hands. Um, that's where the ball court on this island was. The easternmost ball court ever found is this island. I know Antigua and I know St. John and I know Tortola are all trying to claim it, but they haven't got anywhere near the site that we had here. Um, Coastal Zone Management requires archaeology. Uh, State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, Mr. Krieger, right? he's the Deputy State Historic Preservation Director here. It's in his office at the Good Stuff Hides. Um, the museums of these islands, um, believe it or not, Fort Frederick has an incredible archaeology collection. And I'm probably the last person in this room to have seen I saw it a few years ago because I was looking for something to have in the French period. They have a lot of that. They have a lot of pre-Columbian material. Um, Star Preservation Commission, that's a plug for one of the organizations I'm with. Um, the organization that both John and I are, have on the back of our shirts, the St. Croix Archaeological Society. Um, we have a museum up at Six Company Street. Next to Lancheria, we're only open on Saturdays because it's either John or me that's running it. Uh, we both have other jobs that pay, or actually sort of contribute to our well-being. Um, and um, the Museums Association of the Caribbean is trying, and far most importantly for me at this point in time, particularly, is the International Association for for Caribbean archaeology, IACA. I made the really silly mistake three years ago. <laughs> I got this gentleman to write me a letter of support. I don't know why he did it, but he did. <laughs> and I had the governor write a letter of support. We're having the Caribbean Archaeology Congress here next year in July. 200 archaeologists talking about the archaeology of the Caribbean from 4000 BC to 2000 AD. We'll be here for five days. I think it's spare hundred thousand dollars they can spare and give me. I think so. But um, first time we will be here on these islands in the 56 years of that organization's history. Um, I'm still not quite sure what, how I'm going to get my Senate back, but I will. Um, and in closing, Some of the pots we get. That gray one on the left has incredible decorations around the rims. Both of these were found shattered in pieces in St. Thomas. And um, thank you very much for listening to me the last, oh, I don't know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, and if there are any questions or anything else, I'm here to answer them.